All right, uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here with us today. This is the third Protein Engineering and Design webinar organized by the journal Protein Engineering Design and Selection, or PEDS for short. My name is Roberto Chica. I am the editor-in-chief of the journal, as well as a professor at the University of Ottawa. And um, before we get started, I'd just like to say a few words about our journal. And um, the first thing I'll mention is that this journal is a community-run journal, meaning that everyone who makes decisions related to the journal is a scientist in the protein engineering and design field, just like you. And because of that, uh, we aim to really uh, provide the, the kind of service you would, we would want when we get our manuscripts reviewed. So fast review, transparent review, but importantly, expert review. So people in your field that know what you're doing, that understand your methods, will provide expert advice to help you improve your work before it gets published. Furthermore, recently we moved to an online-only model. That means that your papers will get published online quicker than they used to before. And importantly, we've also been able to eliminate all publication charges with the exception of the optional open access fee. So another benefit of publishing with us. And lastly, I'll mention that um, we work hard to promote your work in various ways, um, most notably through our social media platform. And one way to promote your work is what we're doing here today, uh, which is a webinar that will give a global audience to our speakers. And obviously, the speakers are uh, not only experts in the field, but they, there are also people who are are or have been associated with the journal, either to the uh, editorial board or people who have published in the journal. And today, that's something that I'm truly excited about, is to have one of our speakers uh, who will be presenting their work that they recently published in the journal. And what makes me even more excited about this presentation is that uh, the person presenting is a student. So I think it's important to give this platform to the junior members of our community, you know, to help in their career development uh, because uh, they are the next uh, leading researchers and uh, it's important for us to include them uh, in our activities and our community. Okay, so before I introduce the speakers, I just like to uh, provide a little bit of um, information on how this webinar will work. So number one, uh, we will have two presentations, a short one um, of about 15 minutes, followed by a short question period. And after that, we'll have our keynote lecture of about 40 minutes with another question period. Throughout these presentations, you will be able to ask questions by typing them using the Ask a Question button that's at the bottom middle part of your window. So if you have a question, please type it there, and the presenters will uh, answer them at the end of their presentations. You can also use possibly the chat box um, you know, if you want to use that, that's fine. Uh, however, that one uh, tends to be less monitored. So if you could use the Ask a Question button, that's pre preferable. OK, great. So um, I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Maggie Fink, who is presently a PhD student at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, she will be presenting work that she did as an undergraduate student in the group of uh, Dr. Shahir Risk at uh, the Indiana University South Bend. And this work was selected as the Editor's Choice article in PEDS. And uh, this article is freely uh, readable by everybody uh, on the PEDS Journal's website. Uh, so without further ado, I welcome Maggie, who will tell us about her protein engineering work. OK, I hope shortly everybody can see my screen. Um, I cannot see you guys at all. So if there is an issue where my screen is not visible, please let me know. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some of the work in Dr. Ritz's lab and some of the basic questions we asked about protein engineering and then show you guys some of the results from our recent paper that was published. So um, we take an engineering approach to developing these new protein functions, but we use existing structures to do that. 
Um, so we know that protein structure is really linked to its function, and we see a wide variety of structures um, within what we know about proteins at the moment. And uh, we can determine a lot about what a function might be based on its structure and sequence. However, nature repurposes a lot of the same structures and motifs over and over again. Uh, so proteins with nearly identical structures can have sequences that have very different functions. So this is how we get a lot of the diversity in life by making small changes to these proteins rather than just generating something new every single time an organism might want to change something. So rather than thinking about de novo protein engineering, can we take existing structures and modify them to generate new functions? And that's the question that um, we ask in the risk lab. So there's two general approaches that we take. I'll briefly talk about one, but our main focus today will be on the other one. Um, so we can have a protein that has a natural function. Let me put my laser pointer quickly. Uh, a normally functioning protein acquires a mutation, and then we have an impaired function. So for our purposes, this is typically an enzyme that's associated with a disease. So that mutation uh, makes the enzyme no longer functional. Um, and you have some type of disease presentation. So what we can do is we can use protein engineering to restore that function. And to do that, we use antibody fragments or FABs. So we can engineer these to interact with the impaired protein and we get restored function that way. So I'm not gonna talk about that uh, today, but that is another key aspect of the risk lab research. Um, the other thing that we do is we can take a normal fu uh, functioning protein and engineer it to have something to behave completely differently or have an entirely new function. And the way that we do that is using paraplasmic binding proteins. And I'll talk about those in just a minute, but this is the main scaffold we use for this approach in our protein engineering. And the four areas of research that these uh, two different proteins fall into are biosensors, which is what we just recently published and I'll be talking about today. Uh, enzyme rescue is really going to fall into this category here where we're restoring function of a mutated protein. Um, Self-assembly and nanostructures are another really interesting area of research that's ongoing right now that actually will combine these two, the PBPs and the FABs, to get something that can self-assemble based on specific interactions that we engineer. Um, but today we're just going to be talking about the biosensors. So paraplasmic binding proteins, or PBPs, are this very large group of proteins. They're bacterial ligand binding proteins. Um, so you can see here, just like I mentioned, uh, structure is very, very similar, even though they all bind to something entirely different. And they have these similar two domains that you can see here in yellow and blue, and then these binding pockets where something like uh, maltose, which you can see in MBP right here, you may have heard of MBP, it's a pretty commonly studied paraplasmic binding protein, um, or iron or glucose, there's a wide variety of ligands that these proteins can bind to. And as they are, these paraplasmic binding proteins can act as sensors without any engineering really, because they undergo this very dramatic conformational change. So here we have maltose binding protein in its APO or open form, and then upon maltose binding, it goes into this closed conformation, much like Pac-Man clamping down on its ligand. You can also see this animation here as well, where as maltose binds in this binding pocket, you have a shift in the protein structure. And what you can also notice here is this fluorescence reporter that's added to the protein that will change fluorescence upon conformational change, which indicates a ligand binding. And we can monitor this level of fluorescence and we can get an idea about the concentration of the ligand in the sample. And we can uh, use this as a detection and measurement, me uh, measurement method using just this naturally occurring protein with the addition of a fluorophore. However, this is limited to the natural ligands that bind to these PBPs. So while maltose binding protein is super useful, we're not necessarily interested in monitoring maltose concentrations in environmental samples. It's not really a biosensor that's going to have any relevance um, so how can we get these PBPs to bind to synthetic molecules of interest? Um, there's no naturally binding proteins for these because they're synthetic. Um, so can we re-engineer the PBPs to bind to something that we're interested in? And it's kind of a two-prong approach to do this. Um, we need to understand the binding mechanism first, and then we can make the appropriate modifications to bind to a new ligand. So for our recently published paper, we use phosphonate binding protein, or PHND. 
And you can see here, this has the same type of structure as maltose binding protein I showed you before, where it undergoes this conformational change upon the ligand binding. And the natural ligand for this is this 2-aminoethylphosphonate, and it has a KD of about 500 nanomolar. And this is what it's normally going to be binding to, and here's a long list, or not a long list, but here's some other phosphonates that this protein can bind to. But if you'll notice this last one here at the bottom, this is glyphosate, which is a synthetic molecule, and it has a pretty high KD, 650 micromolar, but this provides us for the potential to work with this phosphonate binding protein and see if we can increase the affinity to bind to glyphosate. Because glyphosate is a very environmentally relevant molecule. It's the main ingredient in Roundup, which is an herbicide you can just go to the store and buy. Um, and while there's been some controversy over the um, how harmful glyphosate can be, it has been linked to cancer, antibiotic resistance, and there's a lot of um, concern about a potential environmental hazard with water contamination because of runoff when um, large farms are treated with um, the herbicide Roundup. So being able to monitor and sense when glyphosate is present um, is really important, and this phosphonate binding protein provides us a nice scaffold to engineer this um, to bind to glyphosate with a higher affinity. So the first thing we need to do is look for the difference what's accounting for the difference in the affinity between its natural ligand to AEP and the uh, glyphosate. So here you can see our 2-AEP. It's being coordinate, coordinated by this glutamic acid and aspartic acid here, it's, um, interacting with this amino group. But if we look at glyphosate, we see that not only is it a bit longer, we also have this carboxylate group here, which is going to introduce a negative charge into the binding pocket, which would not be favorable with these two residues here. So we have to address the steric issue as well as the negative charge. So what we decided to do is to change these amino acids, the 177 and 205, which um, correspond to the glutamic acid and aspartic acid. And we decided to use serine, which is a lot smaller, so that's going to help address the size issue, and then asparagine, which will help accommodate the carboxylate. And you can see the results for the KDs of these mutants here compared to, again, wild type, which is 650 micromolar. This mutation didn't seem to do too much. The double mutant um, lowered it a bit, but uh, where we saw the most uh, enhancement of affinity was with this E177N, uh, which brought it down to eight micromolar. This last one, however, was an additional mutation that we made, which truncated the last six amino acids uh, because phosphonate binding protein actually forms a dimer. Um, so by doing this, we convert it to a monitor monomer, and that also increases our affinity down to four micromolar, which is fantastic. Uh, it's a big difference from 650 micromolar. So the question is, does this work? Can we actually detect glyphosate um, by itself and then move into more complex samples? So here, um, rather than having an increase in fluorescence, which we saw with that MVP animation, we actually see a decrease in fluorescence. So here in the open circles is no glyphosate. And then when we, when we saturate with glyphosate, um, we see a very dramatic uh, decrease in fluorescence from our mutant. So we labeled this with a fluorophore and then we're able to monitor the fluorescence change as a result of conformational change. And we, you can see here, we were able to generate these binding curves with both glyphosate, pure glyphosate, as well as Roundup, which is going to have the glyphosate in it, as well as some other molecules. So being able to um, see the sensitivity to glyphosate in a more complex solution is encouraging as well. And again, just to look at the KDs of these um, different, uh, of the mutant compared to wild type. And if you look at glyphosate, again, we brought this down quite low. And um, with the Roundup, it's still uh, quite low as well. Um, we did uh, change the KDs for some of these other phosphonates, but this glyphosate one is the one that had the most significant change. Um, so lastly, um, we want to know, to look at soil and water samples. That's really where we would like to take this biosensor into um, the, the environment. Um, so we were able to determine a linear correlation between the fluorescence response and the concentration of Roundup. And then we were able to uh, add our mutant protein uh, to uh, a sample treated with Roundup, so soil, treated here in uh, sample two, and water treated here in sample four, and we can actually calculate the amount of glyphosate using our linear correlation. Um, so we know that our concentration that we added was 10 micromolar, 
And you can see here our calculated amount based on our fluorescence response was very similar. Um, so this is encouraging and we can detect as little as 0.2 micromolar of Roundup, which is well below the limit for drinking water in the United States. So our sensor is um, environmentally relevant as far as the range it can detect and it's quite um, sensitive as well. So we were able to design this phosphonate binding protein into a glyphosate biosensor and we're able to use fluorescence to monitor the change in this um, because as I've said, conformational change is associated with this ligand binding. In this case, um, we engineered it to bind to glyphosate and we can detect this in sub micromolar range. So in the future, we hope to be able to incorporate this into some type of device that can be taken out into the field and applied in these more environmentally relevant situations. Um, the other thing that we began to explore is generating fabs to increase the affinity. So I mentioned those fabs earlier, and this is an example of maltose binding protein with a fab, and these uh, act, act allosterically to affect the affinity of the engineered um, PVP. So being able to do that it gives us a little bit more control over the range that we're interested in detecting. And this also goes back to the big picture of this approach to engineering proteins. Um, specifically, I mentioned here for other phosphonates using phosphonate binding protein, but in general, the strategy to do this to cover a wide range of possible uh, ligands that we're interested in monitoring and detecting. So for phosphonates, um, things like pesticides and nerve agents are going to be what we're interested in. So the last thing I want to mention before I take questions is another part of the risk lab is science communication. And um, it's really awesome to be able to share with scientists the research that we do, but it's also equally important that we share what I'm talking about today with people in our communities. And one way that the risk lab has done this is Dr. Risk and I have started this social media collaboration called Folding Moonlight, where we use art and storytelling to talk about these things with people who don't have the same access to science that all of us have had. So any of the artwork that you saw in this presentation was done by Dr. Risk and myself. So if you're interested in this kind of thing in science communication, um, we're happy to have you guys along. You can find us on social media um, and we'd love to talk more about this as well. Um, so thank you guys so much for inviting um, me and our lab to present our work. And I wanna thank IUSB chemistry and biochemistry department, our funding as well. Um, but mostly this guy here, Pierre Nguetta, he was, did most of the work on this uh, paper and this research and he is at UNC Chapel Hill giving his own presentation today so he could not be here with us um, and Dr. Risk as well and you can check out his lab website and learn about all the awesome work he does with undergraduate research students at the University, Indiana University South Bend. So I will be happy to take any questions you guys might have. I do have to exit out of this to see your questions so momentarily. I can see if there's any. Okay, great. So uh, thanks a lot, Maggie. That was an excellent presentation. Well done. And uh, very nice science as well. And pretty exciting that um, uh, science communication project you, ha you mentioned there at the end. So I uh, predict a lot of good things for you in the, in the coming years. Okay, so congratulations. Okay, so now we can open the floor to questions. So again, uh, please type them in the uh, ask a question uh, box at the bottom there. I think Maggie, you already have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can answer that, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So Liz asks, how do you identify and prioritize mutations to increase glyphosate binding? So I think the general idea is we can understand how the natural ligand binds based on the chemical interactions it's having with those residues. And I know for the phosphonate binding protein, there was already some previous work that identified some of these particular residues. Um, so then if you compare that to whatever molecule you're interested in, which in this case was glyphosate, we can look at the differences between the two molecules and how those residues might affect that interaction. So it's really an, a trial and error thing in some ways of thinking that these interactions will be the most um, important and sometimes that's wrong and it's something entirely different than the interaction you predict but there is a lot of trial and error i think in the cloning process and and testing to determine which ones would be the, the most beneficial and do you, and ben asked and do you apply the same principle to fabs so the fabs are a, a little bit different and i have not actually done any of the the 
engineering and design aspect of the fab. I know we have these large um, fab libraries where we use page display and just do a lot of screening, um, but those libraries were made prior to uh, me joining the lab, so I don't know all the specifics about uh, the design process, but it's a lot more screening um, using page display and selection for fabs that will interact in the way that you want. <clears throat> uh, I don't see a name on this question, but great work. I'd like to know more about the floor four and why do you think that the fluorescence response decreased red shifted in the presence of glyphosate? Um, so the floor four I used um, and the results I showed you was acrylidan. Um, in the paper, um, there is a little bit more information on some other fluorophores that we tested and we have some results where we use coumarin as well. Um, which showed an even bigger uh, change in the fluorescence. Um, so you can find a little bit more about that, the different ones we tested. I don't remember them all off the top of my head. Um, so I don't know why the the, the response decreased necessarily, um, probably just something of, of where the um, fluorophore was on the protein, the conformational change affected it that way. I can't remember the exact um, location that we that we labeled at. At the off the top of my head, um, so I hope that answered your question. Any? I have a question, Maggie. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it's pretty cool that you can detect a concentration of glyphosate that's under the limit. Mm -hmm. It may be good also to detect something that's higher than the limit because then it would be a problem, I guess, in the environment, and. Um, it's, the fact that you're starting your wild type protein has a KD in the hundreds of micromolar gives you a lot of, of, of still possibilities to go between that and the final KD you got for your variant. So is that something that uh, you guys are following up to basically change the dynamic range to be in the higher concentration? Yeah, I think both the combination of the different mutants that I showed, there's some a range of KDs there with either the double mutant or the um, Theorine mutant. Um, also, the fabs that we are currently working with can also uh, increase or decrease affinity depending on how they're interacting. So being able to have that two component system um, to play around with without making any more changes to the actual binding pocket, because then we can maybe get some cross binding with maybe other um, naturally occurring phosphonates. So combining um, those different mutations we made, and I think with the fabs and altering um, the affinity that way might be a useful way to explore a, a wider range of concentrations. Great. I think you have a few more questions that popped in. Mm. Can uh, Anna John ask, could you comment on how newer computational approaches can speed up the process of identifying new ligands for PHNDs or PVPs? Um, I wish I could. I'm not very familiar with a lot of the computational approaches. I've not really had much experience in that um, personally. I do know that it could possibly speed up the process. I think for our project, we kind of already had some information to go on, um, which was why we were able to to make more specific, uh, you know, mutations and identify those specific ligands. But for doing that for something entirely new, I'm sure computational approaches would, would definitely speed that up. I'm just not familiar enough to, to know what the newest one would be. Um, we have another question. Could you explain how monomerizing the protein increases the affinity? Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I'm sure it just has something to do with the conformational change that's associated with that binding, where taking out this other large, you know, protein um, allows the glyphosate to bind a little bit better. I, I'm going to guess maybe something sterically by removing the, the the dimer that would help. How did you define the KD? Um, I, I'm. I think what you're asking me is how did we determine the KD? Um, we were able to monitor the fluorescence change as we titrated in um, different concentrations of either the glyphosate or the Roundup, and we were able to determine that halfway point, um, which would be the KD for that. We were able to generate that binding curve um, correlating the 
the concentration to the fluorescent response that we were getting. Um, another question from Shio, have you considered if other homologs of the protein provide you with altered properties? I, I'm sure that that would be the case. I think that the, the, the family of paraplasmic binding proteins are, is so large um, that there, there could be a lot more um, to be explored. Um, whether that's the, the dramatic, how dramatic the conformational changes would maybe give you heightened you know, fluor fluorescent response. I'm sure that could be uh, something to look into. Um, and it just depends, I think, more on the ligand that you're interested in monitoring how that fits into the binding pocket of that particular protein. Um, so I think that's it, really unexplored the, what you could do with this particular family of proteins. Okay, great. I think we're going to stop here in the interest of time. If there are more questions, you can type them. I'm sure Maggie will be happy to answer them, uh, typing the answer in the text box. So again, please join me in thanking Maggie for a very nice presentation. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, our keynote speaker, Dr. Berthe Hücke from the University of Bayreuth, and she's laughing now because I've always struggled in pronouncing her name correctly. <laughs> okay, um, but in any case, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Birte, and uh, so I'll just give a short background on, um, on her, um, her training and her current research interests. So she uh, obtained her uh, PhD degree from the University of Göttingen. Again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing uh, German words. And from there, she moved to Duke University for a postdoctoral fellowship in uh, protein design. And um, she started her independent uh, group first at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen in 2006, where she was promoted to a group leader in 2011. And in 2016, she moved to the University of Beirut as a full professor. And she's been uh, very interested in exploring evolutionary uh, ideas or concepts uh, in protein design. And she's published a lot of nice work uh, in this area. And um, I think that's what you're going to tell us about today, right? Yes. OK, so thanks a lot for accepting the invitation. And I look forward to your presentation. Hey, thanks, Roberto, for a nice introduction. I'm just going to try pulling this up here. Um, So I hope, oops, I hope everybody can see um, my presentation because I can't see you. Okay, so thanks very much, Roberto, for the invitation and a um, chance to tell you a little bit about our ideas on how you can use evolutionary concepts in protein design. Um, I think we've just heard a really nice talk from Maggie about how you want to optimize binding pockets, for example, for new ligands or um, actually adjust proteins um, to your needs. And what we often do is we look for to nature to kind of get an idea of um, what's there and what we have to compare ourselves to. So that's why I often like to start by presenting um, a picture that was drawn by David Gutzel on, um, on E. coli proteins um, in an or in a cell. So here you have your outer membrane, paraplasmic space, and then you have all these nice um, different kind of proteins in the cytoplasm, um, polypeptide chains coming off of ribosomes, folding into all sorts of different proteins. And that's really what fascinates me, that the protein universe that we have today, so all the modern proteins are really very different in their folds and in their functions. And so that actually prompts a couple of questions that are central to our work. So one of those questions is actually, how did all of these evolve? How did this diversity um, come to be? And then the other question is, did actually nature sample all possibilities? And I guess we already see with all these designs that there are new versions that we can build. Um, but what kind of fold space has nature sampled, for example? That's another question one can ask. And then this leads clearly to hopefully get a, that we get a better understanding of, um, of how proteins fold and function and that we can hopefully then design better sequences 
Um, and that's basically the other question. How can we do this efficiently to make functional proteins? So I think when we look into nature, we already get some good ideas of how nature has tackled this problem. Because um, when you look at any random sequence um, of amino acids, any random peptide, most of them, they would not fold. So if you just make a peptide, many of them will just crash out, aggregate, do all sorts of things, but not form these very nice compact structures as we are used to. Um, but then once there is a solution, that's something that nature reuses. So that's something that we see when we have proteins, that we have similar proteins in different contexts. For example, um, this is supposed to be a very idealized tin barrel that does an enzymatic function. And then it is often associated with different accessory domains that make this, um, that modulate this function. So what we see is that nature reuses independently folding modules or domains. But when you think about a domain, that's already pretty large. Um, so a tin barrel, for example, is 200 amino acids. That is really big in order, uh, if you think about this coming about de novo. So the question had arisen already a while ago that um, how did these domains themselves um, came to be? And that, that's where you actually see a very similar mechanism. You actually see that also something that is defined as a domain also evolved through smaller units. It's pretty clear when you look at repeat proteins like um, TPR repeats, beta propellers, or so on and so forth, there one can often see smaller units that are um, added on top of each other. And that's one mechanism that seems to lead to more complex proteins, namely duplication. Um, but there's also another mechanism called recombination I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. So with repeat proteins, these are mostly solenoids. There, maybe this is easier to see, but also in a very central protein fold um, that I'm very interested in, the tin barrel, which is typical for enzymes, there are indications for um, repeat structures that have led to its, um, its evolution. And so um, this is something I looked already uh, on um, pretty early together with Reinhard Sterner. Um, we actually um, investigated a protein from histidine biosynthesis pathway called HIS-F, it's uh, imidazole glycerol phosphate synthase. And I draw now here the cartoon of this tin barrel. And already colored are two halves that you can actually nicely superimpose. Um, so when the structure was solved by Dietmar Lang, you could really nicely see that this must have come from a, um, a half barrel ancestor. And you can see it in the topology too. After the first beta strand, you have longer loops, even secondary structure elements seem to be in both in a similar way. There's um, even a, a phosphate binding site is in both halves, which is um, binding this sort of um, symm symmetric um, uh, substrate. So that led to one, um, one test to see whether we can actually um, recreate such a duplication event. And that's something that we can do, actually taking one half of this um, tin barrel, just the C-terminal half, on the gene genetic level, um, duplicating and fusing those. Um, we got a protein that was already um, folding quite nicely, but then a few mutations at the interface um, gave a really nicely compact protein. So that's one way we can even go to the lab and take a modern protein's fragment and then still do duplication and reach a new tin barrel. You can also take another another half barrel, uh, uh, so a half barrel from another protein. So we did this with um, a related uh, protein. Um, actually, his A is just preceding in his, uh, his gene biosynthesis pathway, and we took one half of this and combined it with one half of his F. And you can also get a nicely uh, folded tin barrel. So really, within these folds, also these globular folds, duplication and recombination seem to be a um, mechanism to reach complexity. But what if you think of the rival of different kind of folds? So half barrels have not really been around. And um, one question was, well, where do they come from? And um, this is why I want to show you two proteins where we actually can see similarities, but on the first glance, they look quite different. So here's again, Tim, the Tim barrel, his F, um, as we know it. And then on the right-hand side is a flavodoxin-like protein. It's a response regulator for chemotaxis, QI. And you see in the first um, view that they have very different shapes, but they also share that they both have parallel beta strands and alpha helices. And when I color this, I hope you can see that this green part is actually very similar to this gray part here in the tin barrel. And you can nicely superimpose this, at least on the structural level. 
And so the, this caused us to say, well, can we maybe just simply swap one of those fragments? Can we take the green part out of its context and put it into a new context? And that's something we did. We made the protein again, we made again the gene, expressed the protein, we could, solve, we could purify it and solve the crystal structure even. So it was really well behaved. And the crystal structure, um, so only solved at 3.1 angstrom, but still you can really see, well see the packing here and you can see the topology. In blue is a part coming from the tin barrel, in green is a part coming from the flavadoxin protein, and they make a nice barrel. But they actually have an additional secondary structure element, namely here at the C-terminus, a ninth beta strand. Maybe when we look from the side, you can see better that this intercalates between the first and the second beta strands of this flavadoxin like protein. So really what this shows is that you can take fragments from modern proteins, you can put them together, you get again a protein, but maybe not fitting exactly like we expected. So this um, C-terminal part that usually doesn't form a, a beta strand, it actually even includes still residues from the purification tag, um, this is something that plugged a hole. So something is not quite fitting, but it's still forming a nice proper protein. And what's also nice is that it still keeps some functionality. So as I told you, his F is binding uh, phosphorylated compounds. Um, and one of the phosphate binding sites is um, transferred here. And in our crystal structure, we have a sulfate. So it seems that this is still, this functional site is still retained. So in a first step, and this was a work actually of um, my first um, summer student, Tanmay Barat, who, um, um, who um, made these recombination events. Um, so this is the first step that we did, taking a, a fragment from um, QI with his F and recombining it. We did the same now also with the nitride response regulator. Um, so Soban did this and we, um, we received also a, a well-folded protein, although we couldn't solve the structure. So then we asked ourselves, uh, well, how far off are we from a proper tin barrel and what is really missing? What is not really fitting right? And this was then the project of Simona Eisenbeis and we teamed up here with um, Jens Meiler from Vanderbilt University and looked into this um, from a computational perspective because just staring at the structure wasn't really telling us what to fix. So what did we do here? We used Rosetta Design um, to optimize this protein, but we went into this whole thing with um, with a homology model of the eight-stranded barrel that we had originally expected. So we created this, um, or we modeled this um, tin barrel as we expected it, and then we used Rosetta Design to repack. And um, so we made many different models with Rosetta. We um, introduced many different mutations, and then we put these um, on, uh, so then we actually sorted them by the number of amino acids uh, or mutations that it needs to reach a certain uh, reserve energy unit per amino acids. So this is the energy, the lower the better, but this also means more mutations, which poses a question, is more mutations really necessary? So natural proteins are just as stable as they need to be, but when is it stable enough? And so maybe this is what's giving us an uh, indication, namely this dotted line here, which is a um, minimized uh, native composite energy of the parental fragments. So that's what you reach with the QI part and the HIS-F part. And um, so we said, well, a couple of mutations will already get us here. And this will also teach us much more about what's not fitting in this protein. So we looked at all of those mutations that you can introduce in order to reach this kind of energy. And um, we made, um, we looked at these mutations. So here, for example, um, at position four, there used to be an arginine and now there's hardly ever one, so clearly there should be a hydrophobic residue, valine or isoleucine. In other cases, the black ones are the, um, the ones, the mutation are, are no mutations, the residues that were there before, so those we did not change. And so we looked through all those mutations that were suggested and picked the five most uh, with the biggest effect. And they are basically, mostly they're going towards smaller amino acids um, or just slightly smaller ones. Okay, so we introduced all of these five mutations at once. And we could, um, we, we actually had an even better behaving protein, much more solubly expressed uh, protein. Um, and uh, we actually could also then solve the structure, not by crystallography, that somehow didn't want to work, but by NMR. 
And it's already a fairly big protein for NMR, but it was um, really well behaved also at 40 degrees. And so we could um, solve this at elevated temperatures. And that was together with uh, miracles at the MPI in tubing. So basically that means we were able to combine two fragments and introduce a few mutations at the interface and reach something that looks like a proper timber. Now you might say, yeah, so what can it do? Um, well, it can still bind. Um, namely, it can still use this phosphate binding site and bind um, phosphorylated compounds. And we used here a product analog from a tryptophan reaction because it's fairly similar, but it only has one phosphate um, that needs to be bound. And um, so our starting protein here is, uh, uh, so you can also follow this by fluorescence titration. And so um, this chimera can already bind um, this compound, but we can increase it with two more mutations where we introduce um, complementary charges on this side, and then we reach here an affinity that is similar to the blue one. So the blue um, one is actually the natural protein. And so we reach now a low, um, low um, micromolar binding constant, which is similar to any enzymes that bind these compounds. So we would say these mutations reach towards a protein that you could, could consider um, competitive, being able to be competitive in a natural environment. So in that respect, we think that these designs can actually mimic evolutionary events. And so taking a fragment, taking two fragments, recombining, we get a protein that is not quite what we wanted. It's more like a hopeful monster. That's a term that's usually used in, in organismal evolution, but it is a topology that is not found in nature, that at least either nature has sampled it and we haven't seen it or it's gotten rid of it again, or who knows, but it could be a way towards a new topology that probably in most cases, you will then add mutations that will um, converge back to the, to the starting scaffold and in, within a futile cycle, and you end up with a tin barrel that looks not different at all to a starting tin barrel. Which actually begs the question then, if we can do this, what about nature? Has it also done it? Did tin barrel actually originate maybe from flavodoxin parts? So that's the next question that I'd like to talk about. So are these two folds truly evolutionarily related? Well, what can we say about evolutionary relationship? Um, we see very high, uh, we saw very high structural similarity, but that can be also due to convergence. Um, so um, what we need to look at is sequence. And for the sequence comparisons, um, we actually need to consider a few things. So here is just to remind you the way we usually order proteins. So for example, in SCOP or CAS, you have this fold level. So here in SCOP, you would have the beta alpha 8 barrel um, and then the flavodoxin light fold. And underneath you have the super families and both of them are pretty large folds. They have very many members and this beta alpha 8 barrels have 33 different super families like TIM, trisphosphate isomerase or aldolases and many more. The flavodoxin-like have 15 superfamilies. The QI-like I already showed you, that's the response regulators. There's also one called B12 binding and 13 more. So when we usually talk about proteins being homologous, then we usually think of these within one superfamily. Because they have the same structure, they have the same functions, they often have similar sequences. So what we need to look at right now is actually compare at this level between superfamilies of different folds. And so to do this, what we have done is we built for each superfamily, we built hidden Markov model profiles, and then we did profile profile comparisons. And these are tools that were developed uh, actually at the MPI in Tübingen by Johannes Söding. He's now, um, he now has this group in, at the MPI in Göttingen. And um, man, many of you probably have seen some of his tools, um, but one of them is this HHPRED, which we um, used. And we compared all of these um, um, these profiles towards each other. And we try now to put all of this data into one slide. So here are the 33 superfamilies from the beta alpha eight barrels. Numbers don't matter right now. Flavodoxin on the right side. And now I'm gonna draw a, um, a line whenever there is a bi-directional hit with the HH search program at a reasonable p-value. Let's look at the flavodoxin first. There's a few hits that we have bi-directionally, but not by far not all, which means we don't even know whether the flavodoxalite fold is um, has a monophyletic origin. Maybe it actually arose multiple times, but there are a couple of them that are related. 
If you look at the tin barrels, the picture is very different. We have lots of um, connections here. There's just three where I don't draw a line at this p-value. If you lower it slightly, we actually these come come in as well. And especially here, these very highly connected ones are all tin barrels that bind a phosphorylated compound. Okay, so it really looks like the tin barrel has a monophyletic origin. Um, this had been already 10 years ago, had been uh, discussed as well, but now we can basically connect almost all of the families. Okay, so let's look at the com um, comparison between the flavodoxin and the vital fatty barrel superfamilies. And what's amazing is that there's many, many more connections now between those two superfamilies from flavodoxin to the tin barrels than within the flavodoxin themselves. So this number one uh, flavodoxin like fold, um, C.23.1 in stop classification, it's the response regulators. C.23. Um, okay, somebody's writing something, sorry. Okay, um, 23.6 um, is a, a vitamin B12. Uh, and they are by, they have give many, many hits towards the um, towards the beta alpha barrels. Okay, so there seems to be something going on, and we started to look for sequences that give us um, intermediate um, intermediate features. So where no structure is known, but they lie right in the middle of those other sequences. And we found a whole family uh, between those two um, superfamilies, and of one of those members, um, we, solved the, we solved the crystal structure. And that is the um, Sumatoga Maritima 0182. Um, we solved this by experimental phasing, um, and of the, dimeric, uh, of the dimeric protein, it also in solution exists as a monomer, but that didn't crystallize, so it could also be that this looks slightly different. So in the dimer, you actually have a swap event. So there's a one, there's one beta strand that swaps in between those two, um, those two chains. But if we look at the topology, because that's what we would like to compare, um, uh, let's look at this com uh, comparison. So we start with a beta strand, and then we have an alpha helix and another beta strand on the one side, and that's very similar to flavodoxin-like proteins. So let's compare this to the closest um, other two folds. So here, the tin barrel on the left, the flavodoxin on the right, and in the middle, you see now our NTM-182. And it has a very flavodoxic character, but it is much more round in its beta sheet. Uh, it also has a six beta strand, which the flavodoxins don't have. So it does have some of the features of a tin barrel, it seems. And what's also very interesting is that the um, the highest sequence similarity is really within an alpha beta alpha beta element, which basically corresponds to a quarter barrel. This is also where in the tin barrel and in the flavodoxin uh, the ligands are bound. They have um, similar chemistries, but they're bound in a different way. Okay, and what's interesting as well is that this kind of quarter is something that you can find multiple times in tin barrels. So I was telling you before that Tim barrels probably evolved from a half barrel, but maybe it actually evolved from an even smaller fragment, namely um, a quarter barrel. And that brings me to something that I want to um, sort of um, slot in here, a little excursion on a de novo design where we, I think, could benefit a lot from the knowledge that we had already on how um, tin barrels, what makes up tin barrels. So, um, when, uh, so we actually teamed up with David Baker um, and Alejandro Fernandez Velasco uh, from UNAM, and um, we wanted to design a tin barrel from scratch. And we wanted to make it an idealized protein, so just the bare bones. Um, it's been a really a design goal for a long time. Um, I found some uh, workshop um, papers from 1986 uh, from EMBL where they already tried to set this up. So we thought, okay, let's give it a try. How do we define a tin barrel? Um, here is just the central barrel shown. It's you have um, beta strands that are twisting around the center. Um, one uh, amino acid always pointing outwards, one inwards, outwards, inwards. So this is um, supposed to show the beta strands. You have hydrogen bonding between it. And there's a certain shear number that gives you this rotation around it. Okay, and so here is the beta strand, uh, the beta strand um, definition for triphosphate are summarized. Um, structure one tim, and um, this is something that we wanted to consider. But we didn't want to have different lengths of the beta strands. We wanted to idealize this and make it actually fourfold symmetric. Eightfold doesn't work because the two beta strands wouldn't really fit next to each other. So the smallest thing is fourfold symmetric. But how to 
Now combine them. There's different ways where you can start. And we decided on these even barrel placing pleats because then we would fit these rules that um, Koga et al. Um, defined in a very nice paper 2012 on how, how you can connect an alpha helix to a beta strand. And only when you have these even feral, um, facing pleats, we really would fit those rules. So this is why we de decided on always starting here with the residue um, pointing this way. This means, however, if you want to connect the beta strands with alpha helices, that you need different orientations of those uh, different alpha helices. You need longer ones between the first and the second beta strand, then you need to connect the second and the third. You also need a different tilt. And so this is basically what defined the alpha helices, the length and the orientation of the beta strands. And then um, basically we, we folded up this um, backbone and started um, fitting sequences with the Rosetta um, software to find the conformational free energy minimum. And to cut a longer sh story short, we tried a number, um, a number of designs. We, uh, we kept optimizing and in including a few more information, especially, um, especially building in um, clamps between um, here at this bottom uh, side of the barrel. And uh, in the end, we, um, we came up with one protein that actually also crystallized, which is called STIM11. And here you can now see the design on top of the X-ray structure, at least in the cartoon, you see that the backbone superimposes very nicely, but also on the side chain level, um, here are two quarters on top of each other in blue, um, on top of the design in, um, uh, in pink. And many of the side chains are also captured the way they were designed. The protein is quite stable. You can unfold it with gunadin chloride. It's very cooperative. Unfolding um, followed by CD or fluorescence, so secondary and tertiary structure is not exactly on top of each other. Um, but um, So it's not a fully two-fold state. But when we unfold with uh, temperature, um, we lose a little bit of secondary structure already at 60, 70 degrees, but the core still seems to be intact and we only really unfold around 80 degrees. So this seems to be loosening of alpha helices is most likely. And when you then uh, let it cool down, the protein refolds very nicely again. Okay, so now um, basically that means that we can build uh, tin barrels also from scratch, from kind of quarter fragments, um, maybe similar to something that nature has built. You might ask, <laughs> you might think, okay, is this really different to what nature has built? Uh, no, it isn't. So this is um, um, so this was done by Caspar Feldmeier. He had been looking at all these tin barrels already, com comparing all of the proteins. Uh, we we had done this already, and this is just a glance map um, where you um, visualize the sequence similarities between all tin barrels that we know. So here are the 33 different superfamilies um, from the tin barrels. Each dot here is one structure or, or one um, yeah one tin barrel that we know, colored by the superfamilies. And all the dots will be drawn uh, or pushed apart unless they have a sequence similarity. So then based on the similarity, the higher similarity, the more they will be drawn together. And this is why you get this clustering. And um, well, there's different subgroups, but clearly the STM11 is far outside. So it is not, um, it's not really in the center of this whole um, of this whole cluster. And oh, what I really forgot is that actually if you just take the sequence and you do blast, you will not find any tin barrel. If you actually do psi blast, three iterations, you will also not hit any barrel. So um, this really seems to be a very different structure, a uh, very different sequence, even though the structure is what we define as a typical tin barrel. Okay, um, so this is by now um, has been extended. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. I just want to refer you to um, a preprint from Sergio Romero, um, um, who worked mostly with um, Alejandro Velasco, but now also with us on extending this um, STM11 to a whole family of de novo TIMs and analyzing their, um, their folding. And um, so uh, this is something I don't have time to talk about, but I, um, I can recommend um, this preprint. All right, so what have I talked about so far? Um, I've shown you that on the one hand, we can identify subdomain size fragments using sequence comparisons. I, what I just showed you with the de novo tim barrel or the quarter barrels that then assemble to the full tim shows that we can even build subdomain size fragments. 
de novo. And what I've shown you with the chimeras is that we can also recombine fragments to build new proteins. And so in, in general, this is something that felt to me like a general approach of using homologous fragments, but maybe also other fragments to build new proteins and maybe enzymes. So the idea is, you know where you have a, an area that um, is similar. This you can use to uh, make an overlap to build a new protein. And if these are already binding interesting ligands, then maybe something will happen. <laughs> but this is at the moment still sort of our dream where, um, yeah, I wanna show you how one can maybe go about this to use this as a more general approach. So first things first, how can we identify useful parts for design? Well, we can do it exactly like we've done um, now with comparing the twin barrels with the flavoroxins. We actually, by these comparisons, found smaller fragments that were highly conserved. So this is something that you can also do in a large scale fashion. And um, that's what we've done here. We built a whole fragment database, on the one hand, doing HMM profiles for all um, all members in SCOP, um, compare all against all, and then store all of those hits, all the matches as, one, as hits in our database. We call it the fold puzzle or short fuzzle uh, database. So it contains on the one hand, these domain sequences uh, and the fragments that actually um, match. And then we complement this with the structural information. So we can also compare the domain structures, um, superimpose where, um, uh, look where these fragments are superimposing and also store this in our full puzzle database. And so we have um, actually more than 8 million hits um, when we search the whole SCARP database. So many, many fragments to play around with. Maybe to represent this a little better, um, this is a view um, using network representation that Noya Ferus used. And you can see here now um, that there's many, oh, yeah, this is sort of our galaxy of all of these um, uh, all of these um, hits and colored by um, um, which part and scope they belong to. So all alpha, all beta, alpha slash beta, and so on and so forth. And you can see that there are many parts that are um, that are giving uh, building a network, but there's one major component in the center. And we can look at it here on the right hand side, a little more detailed. And there's a large part that is actually all alpha slash beta proteins. Also, there's all alpha proteins, and there seem to be even some connections between those two large networks. And here I already indicated some of the um, fold, uh, folds that are um, connecting in this network. For example, C.23 and C.1 are actually flavodoxin and Timbaro. So this is what I've been telling you about before. Maybe let's go to uh, an easier um, or, or an earlier representation that might also give this in the impression or um, show how many different hits there are. So here I'm just um, comparing all the alpha slash beta proteins, um, SCOP superfamily IDs versus itself. This is why you have the diagonal. Whenever there's a blue um, square, this is a very high probability hit. And this means that you have many, many different hits. And what I told you about, about comparing the timber versus the flavodoxin-like fold is all contained in this little red square. So all of these different um, comparisons, all of these fragments are within one of those um, blue points. So that means there are many, many more fragments that we can play with. And you can see already that the tin barrel seems to be highly connected and also flavodoxin-like fold is one of these very highly connected folds. And um, maybe this is the reason why they're also uh, considered super folds. All right, so we started using these fragments um, to um, to build chimeras. We've moved on to, we moved away from tin barrels and but st uh, stuck to the flavodoxin-like proteins, comparing with the uh, paracosmic binding proteins. So some of them you heard, actually you heard about uh, in the previous talk. And so we've already been um, fitting in flavodoxin pieces into, um, into PVPs. Also, we've uh, looked at HEMD proteins, which have this also a two-lobe structure, and it's this bottom lobe is almost a full uh, flavodoxin protein. So um, in, in these cases, it's very interesting because these flavodoxins are binding interesting ligands. So um, one can um, transfer with these fragments also ligand properties. But I don't really want to talk about this right now. I want to also point out um, that you can find interesting information on the evolution of these folds through these, um, these searches. 
So it's especially the theme D, this is something that Sanikta found, um, that when she com looks at these comparisons, she first of all gets um, an, a hit of the heme D um, N terminal half with the heme D C terminal half, and then again, with the flavodoxin protein, even though there's a small area missing, just a few amino acids. And when you look at the, on the structural level where these fragments fit, they're not within one lobe that looks like a domain. No, it's across those two lobes. So it looks like a swapping event. If you take one half, then this, um, this is up here. And this is also what you can see in comparison here on the, on the right-hand side when comparing uh, um, one of the one of the flavodoxins where we have such a good hit with um, one of the heme D that this part is not aligning on top of this helix. So what does it mean for the evolution of these folds? So it's um, it seems that the heme D proteins are much more recent and that the flavodoxins are the more ancient ones. And so how do we envision that a flavodoxin could um, become a heme D? Well, there is this extra bit where we didn't have an alignment with the HEMD, and that actually corresponds to a secondary structure element, an elongated loop that leads most likely to the opening of um, one part of the flavodoxin and, uh, and, and then the other half up here, so that then two of those can form a swapped dimer. If you then have an, um, a gene duplication event, you will actually um, receive a HEMD-like protein. And this extra elongated loop can then form a beta bridge, as is observed in HEMD proteins. We wanted to test this, and we took the um, opposite approach. We tried to reconstruct it the other way around. We took a um, modern HEMD like protein, the uroprofigen 3 synthase, and just cut it in half. We took the C terminal half and expressed it, and we could purify it, but it was really aggregation prone. So what we did next is we eliminated these five amino acids that make up this um, beta bridge um, or this beta strand within the beta bridge and we eliminated that. And then we suddenly had a protein that was very well behaved and we could solve its structure by NMR together with Miracles. And um, this is now the NMR structure showing that we end up with a very nice flavodoxin like protein. So in a way, we can go ahead and take modern day proteins and just kind of apply these mechanisms and, um, and thereby test these evolutionary hypotheses and also building a new flavodoxin-like protein. Okay, so let's wrap this up. What did I tell you so far? Um, well, I hope you agree. Proteins evolved from smaller fragments, subdomain-sized fragments. Uh, we actually built a whole um, database of these with many, many hits. So there's many pieces that we can play around with to build new proteins. Um, and that's something um, that seems to be working fairly well, at least so far. Um, there's always difficulties with um, having proteins express um, in large amounts, but uh, still in the, in the cases that we've done, we were able to solve quite a number of structures. So there seems to be maybe an advantage of using such fragments. And the other advantage that I really see is that Fragment properties can mean um, that you can carry over already um, uh, properties such as binding um, or maybe maybe other properties um, that would allow fast adaptation of functions. And so this is why I see this as a this um, this chimerogen chimerogenesis approach as a complementary approach to other de novo uh, design um, uh, approaches, for example, or repurposing or um, actually directed evolution. All right, so this is where we stand right now. Um, if you are interested in actually looking at um, fr such fragments, whether there's proteins um, that you work with and you're interested whether there are evolutionary relationships, um, you can actually um, use uh, or uh, um, go into our puzzle uh, database or full puzzle database. Uh, you can find it under this um, address. And um, you can browse, um, uh, inserting your PDB or a sequence, and then you can actually um, look at the, um, what, what other proteins it's related to, and um, it visualizes, uh, on the one hand, with networks and also superpositional structures. So please um, go ahead and try. Um, and also, if you were interested in building, um, building chimeras from fragments, um, we now recently um, have developed a, a Python script, or ra um, rather Noelia has developed this. She has um, developed a, a Python script where you can um, sort of automatically build 
from fetching from the fuzzer database, um, taking outputs that you can then first of all represent the relationships and then you can pick which ones you want to use in order to build chimeras. And in this, um, in this preprint, um, she describes this for an example of Rossman proteins and PLU uh, proteins and um, how you can build then all possible chimeras that don't give clashes. You can score these chimeras. This is done with Amber and Charm. And then you can also analyze them and look at typical features like hydrogen networks, salt bridges, hydrophobic clusters, and so on and so forth. So if you wanted to build chimeras, you're welcome to also use these tools and give us feedback how it goes. All right, with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I just want to thank um, uh, all former members and all current members uh, of my group for all the um, fun working together and um, building some of these tools. Here's Noelia, actually, whose um, fossil database work and, uh, and Port Lego I just showed you. Um, Sergio is now here, who's been doing tin barrel design. Um, Sovan has always been involved in building many of these cameras. Florian is building cameras. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to thank actually Stefan Schmidt, who's been involved in the um, fossil database. Um, we work here at UniBioLight also with Christian Schreiner on NMR. Uh, we used to work a lot with Miracles at the MPI and tubing on NMR. Alejandro Velasco, very fun interactions on working on tin barrel design, which was also together with David Baker. And Jens Meiler was the collaboration when we um, improved the QISF interface. And so I'd like to thank them and you. And I look forward to questions. Okay, great. Beautiful talk, Berta. I hope not. <laughs> How do I get out again? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so I think you already have a, a few questions in the uh, text box at the bottom and also in the chat box. Yeah, the chat, that came up and it, suddenly I thought something's happening there. I should ask answer immediately. <laughs> okay, um, maybe I start there then. For the energy simulation in Rosetta model, do we need crystal structure or can we use homology modeling? Also, the sequence comparison based on the enzyme folding requires having a high resolution structure for all the targeted proteins. Okay, so, um, well, we clearly started with a, a homology model and it was really not what we had in our crystal structure. So I would say it can work with homology modeling. Um, sure enough, if your um, model is too far off, then that can cause trouble, I guess. So it's probably helpful if you have a good crystal structure, but um, if your model is good, I think you can also use it. If you don't have anything else, you should go for it. <laughs> okay, then in the text box, let's see. Um, Ah, okay, there's some still from Maggie, and then there's one, uh, Jonna, okay. Uh, how does your groups work on the relationship between the TIM fold and ferret, um, it's a flavodoxin fold, and your overall network view of highly related folds interrelated to the Nanda and Falkowski groups work on the early nature of the ferrodoxin fold and its relationship to the Rossman fold? Okay, so first of all, I think um, it often gets confused um, what we call, so, we, so I talked about flavodoxin-like fold. It's uh, a different fold. It's actually also not flavodoxin itself. <laughs> it's, um, well, it's like the response regulators is a huge family. It's a vitamin B12 binding ones. So it's not exactly the same, but the ferrodoxin, they are also alpha slash beta proteins and they are really, really highly related. So when I was showing you this big component, this kind of network, there were all sorts of alpha slash beta proteins in there. Maybe I have to, so I haven't really checked um, exactly what um, Vignander and uh, Falkowski have in there, but I could imagine that we actually see those relationships. Good point, I should check this out. Thanks, Jonna. Um, can you please comment more on the need for multiple steps of optimization and structure design? How could the efficiency of design be increased? Is the need for multiple steps related to flexibility in the intermediate structures that are not quite well packed, but still quite stable? From Liz Myling. Um, I have to think now that I understand correctly. So um, we do it, I guess we kind of do it stepwise. Um, because the first 
crystal structure showed us where we were wrong and then we could start over. What I'm hoping is that we can maybe skip some of those steps in the future. Um, but maybe that's not, you're also talking about flexibility. Let me read again. Um, yeah, so I think we're still sort of in this learning curve and that's why doing optimization stepwise is helpful because then you see what's what you're actually changing. But I guess the better we get, um, the more um, we might be happy to just go with the bigger steps and, and try to design all the way. Um, but I what I think is that you often often see in the structures that it might not be exactly like you expected. Okay, you were thinking of the work with Baker, which typically involves multiple steps and why some of your structures don't crystallize. Okay, the whole crystallizability issue, I was really surprised that we could solve a really beautiful NMR structure but not get crystals. I'm not sure whether crystallizability is always associated. Um, it's also, you know, if you keep trying, sometimes you get it. Um, well, what Baker is doing um, is often is often then adding directed evolution, right? So, um, or maybe I'm misunderstanding this. So sometimes it's not quite well packed, but in, um, so in our design we saw, yeah, so you get close. <laughs> okay, um, so you get, um, you, you see where things are, where things are um, missing if you solve the structures. And sometimes then you see that things are not packing or not forming as you expected. So this is, I think, what helps in these iterative, in, in these iterative steps. Um, yeah. So for the Tim Barrel design, for example, um, we, we did 30 different designs in the end, and some of them we just couldn't get, um, we could get protein, it was well folded, nice CD, uh, a circular dichroism, for example, but then when you um, when you start um, optimize uh, when you start um, uh, for crystallize uh, crystallizations, you need to you need to concentrate so highly that it starts to aggregate. And so I think what this points at is that you might be going the right direction already, but it's um, in order to get a crystal structure it needs to be um, rigid enough. So maybe those other designs aren't so wrong either. It's just that you can't get your um, structure to really know. Okay, I hope I answered that. <laughs> okay, then, um, ah, yes, uh, I was there, Fabian. Uh, yes, thanks for this question. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about putting new molecular functions into the camera proteins. Um, absolutely, uh, this is this whole idea of taking fragments that, um, that bind already interesting compounds. So one reason um, we took the HEMD was also um, the, uh, took the HEMD with the flavodoxin proteins um, uh, was a vitamin B12 um, binding. So these co or also called cobalamins, they have very interesting functions, but we also learned that they're quite difficult to work with. So, um, but this could be a way where you have from the bottom side, you actually have this vitamin B12 and from the top, you're going to be providing a second, a second ligand. So this is something we're thinking about. We also have been, um, yeah, at least computationally trying to build a couple of other, um, other cameras where we have only been looking at the ligands, um, but they are not really ready for for anything yet. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Did I see all the questions? Maybe you can. There was one just before uh, Fabian's question. So, so Fabian's question was on the. Yeah. So there's one. I'll read it for you. Given this method generates astronomical combinations, I wonder if there are any efforts to screen for new functionality in the library. Ah, there, yes, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, when you build these chimeras, um, I guess the biggest problem is to really get the fragments fitting in a way that your functional units will still have the right um, geometry. So first of all, how will your, um, how, if you want to combine two ligand parts, for example, it can be that you get a chimera where both 
protein parts are fitting together, but then the ligand is not in the right conformation. So you can clearly screen for these geometric terms. You can define what makes up the function that you're looking for, and um, and then you can then you can screen this. Um, uh, definitely, you can screen for this. And often, what what happens is that then there actually might be clashes. You get chimeras that seem to be structurally viable, but then your ligands might overlap, and that doesn't make any sense. So that reduces this astronomical number quite rapidly. Yeah. If I may, Berthe, I'd like to uh, follow up on Liz's question, because, I mean, a big challenge in the field is obviously getting the structure to be exactly what we designed it to be. I think that that still remains challenging. And there's been great progress, of course. Uh, but in the structure you showed for the uh, symmetrical tin barrel, mm -hmm. you could see between the design and the crystal structure, there was a loop that adopted a, a different conformation. And I think that what's really challenging is knowing beforehand that there are these alternate conformations that would be more stable for that exact sequence. Because if we knew that that could exist, then maybe we could, you know, use some kind of negative design to, you know, find sequences that would favor the loop that we want and not the other one. But how do we get there? How do we know of all the possible competing states that would be more favorable for what we're trying for the sequence we're trying to design? And how do we exclude those? Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> so um, actually, there's one loop. There's one loop in this uh, fourfold symmetric tin barrel that is uh, different because it's making a contact with the neighboring um, one in the crystal. So I'm not actually sure whether you have that in solution. That's the other thing. Um, but what's interesting, especially in this fourfold symmetric protein, is that you have it four times, and you can check actually. Shouldn't it all be the same? But it's not. Mm -hmm. So this clearly shows you that there are multiple conformations. Uh, that it can, the same sequence can take up. Um, and uh, it's probably, in, it might be slightly dependent on the position because your first quarter and your last quarter have are different, but the others, the second and third should be ex seeing exactly the same, right? So this is a way already to see how, how um, different they can be. Yes, but how to model this? Um, well, I think modeling, um, trying to see more from a dynamics perspective, trying to do, I think that's something like you're doing as well, right? <laughs> Molecular dynamic simulations can maybe teach you some. Um, and you need to, well, if you really want to try to, to get close, you need to tr um, try to calculate many different states. Right. Or yeah. maybe we can, we can stop looking at these differences as bugs and more as features. Absolutely. Maybe now we have a loop that can adopt multiple confirmations and that could be useful in some other way. So actually, that's the other question then. Do we need to be so precise? Mm -hmm. So sure, this is something because we can measure it. It's nice. You can always say, here's the structure, and now I compare it. But for many of the functions, you don't need it. You right. don't need it to be precise, or you don't you you will lock it in a certain conformation so when the ligand comes with it. So um, I think we're already pretty good with the precision that we have at the moment. Um, and maybe we will learn much more once we add more ligands and not just go for the idealized proteins. Because that's the other thing. The tin barrel, it has no loops, really hardly any loops, right? They're as tiny as can be. Mm -hmm. so, um, this thing is more, it's not a rock. It's too flexible for that. But it, it really, I think it really needs to be diversified. And I think that's what the next steps have to be to really start building in more things. And at the moment, we're building secondary structures, but what we really need to do is have more complex loop-like structures. Right. Great. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if not, please join. Oh, there is one right there. Ah, Liz, to what extent could you separate stable fold from dynamic bits needed for function? Um, well, that's hard because uh, it will be dependent on each other, I think. Um, so one reason why I think the tin barrel is such a great protein fold is because it seems to be doing that. It seems to have this very rigid or it have very stable scaffold. And then you always have at the top, you have many things happening. You have extended loops. So top means at the end of the beta strands connecting to the alpha species. Sometimes you have long loops there, sometimes even a whole domain. And um, so I think um, one needs to 
maybe if we start with something like this, like a very stable scaffold and then adding bits, um, this is maybe a way to connect it. Although you say you want to separate, but I, I think you need to somehow connect it because otherwise you might just have something flopping around. So, um, yeah. But I think that's the way how nature does it. Tim Barrels has this very rigid core. It's often described as this um, kind of this fort and then at the top. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. We all know we can't fully separate. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. All right, great. So thanks a lot for the lively discussion and a very nice presentation. Please join me in thanking our speakers today. And uh, before before we go, I'd just like to mention um, that uh, we have a, a remaining webinar for 2020, which will be on November 25th. And it'll be given by uh, Don Hilbert from ETH Zurich, who, who will tell us about his enzyme engineering work. So I hope to see uh, many of you there. And uh, you can follow all the news related to the journal and these webinars on our uh, Twitter account, um, which um, is P-R-O-T for PROT. ENG, engineering, VS, design, and SEL for selection. So prop eng as cell, you can find that on Twitter. And that's where we post all the, the information about the, um, the webinars. OK, so thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you, uh, Birte and Maggie, for the nice presentations. Thank you.